Welcome to Capri Conversations, a Center for Asia-Pacific Resilience and Innovations inaugural podcast series. I'm your host, Hannah Sems, a Princeton and Asia Fellow at Capri. Born and raised in Washington, D.C., I grew up surrounded by global policymaking. Today, we sit down with Giuseppe Porcaro, a senior leader at Bruegel, one of the world's top economic policy think tanks. Giuseppe earned his PhD in world geography in France and served as an expert at the World Bank and European Youth Forum. As a product of old world Italy and a future thinking science fiction author, Mr. Porcaro is a master of painting the world's most pressing problems in a new light. Today, he visits Capri in Taipei to share his experiences on that. Welcome, Giuseppe. Well, thank you so much uh, for Hannah for inviting me and uh, for letting me in your first episode of uh, your podcast. Yeah. Right? Is it? Is that correct? Our inaugural podcast, yes. So, so thank you so much for that, and I'm looking forward to have uh, an interesting conversation with you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think we can get started. So, um, in your words, with your expertise, what is a think tank to you? So what is a think tank? Uh, this is a good question that many people ask me when I'm around and I say, what do you work for? You know, And uh, it's always a little bit complicated because it's not like a household name for, for people that uh, are not used to be. So usually my reply is I work for a research institute. But obviously a think tank is a little bit more than just a research institute because uh, the general goal of a think tank is to uh, use research in order to advance, advise, and uh, improve uh, certain sets of policies. So it's a very specific uh, um, way of, of using research, which is uh, with um, a practical purpose mm -hmm. on, uh, on, poli on the policy realm. Mm -hmm. That's, that would be my easy and uh, uh, less than 30 seconds kind of reply. Elevator pitch, yeah. yeah. You're a published science fiction author. Tell us about that. Do you think like these scenarios will happen? What's the value of imagining the future and, um, and communicating that creatively versus traditional media, mm. which is typically think tanks sphere? Well, that's a very good point about science fiction. It's not just that I'm interested in science fiction from, uh, let's say, an artistic, literary point of view, which uh, obviously I do, but I approach science fiction as uh, a tool for uh, this broader reflection about why do we need to reflect about the future in the current uh, situation we are in and, and why we need to think about the future not in a um, unilateral way, uh, um, but uh, multiply the possibility that there can be different kinds of future. Mm -hmm. uh, so coming back to the mission of a think tank, for example, which is about providing uh, policy policy uh, scenarios and policy uh, uh, solutions for, for different things, this is per se, it's already uh, an exercise of forecasting and future making. And uh, the fact that uh, um, science fiction brings us a sort of mindset not to be stuck into just uh, a path dependent one one kind of uh, uh, future uh, direction uh, i think it's extremely important today because we are seeing mm -hmm. since things that have been going on for even more than a decade let's say since the global financial crisis uh, we've been seeing that the direction of course of history uh, is uh, is being disrupted all the time and uh, changing direction all the time. So we need a new mindset in order to approach the way uh, uh, future policy making is being designed. Uh, and uh, science fiction helps us with that because uh, it's probably one of the few uh, tools that we have at our disposals where we can be freely thinking about a really radical new scenario while with the current tool set, every time that you're trying to bring some more radical thinking over there, mm -hmm. uh, it might be thought of as uh, either 
too uh, too extreme or not realistic or but sometimes then we see that the actual events are much more uh, extreme and unrealistic than what we would ever ever imagined yeah. in uh, rational logic thinking places such as uh, uh, think tanks but also policy planning departments mm-hmm. of, of governments and institutions so that's a little bit my approach to to use science fiction in this uh, in this realm of policy making as a, as a tool that's fantastic yeah and even the solutions that we imagine with science fiction um they bring ideas from different communication fields. Um, they can combine public sector and private sector, which your book just goes sour and mm-hmm. talks on. Um, and then it actually happens in reality, like Coca-Cola partnering with the uh, USAID mm-hmm. uh, to reach remote locations in Africa to distribute vaccines. Um, so there's value in bringing ideas from different areas geographically, different sectors. Um, at Capri, as Bruegel, I imagine, something we work on on a daily basis is both translating across languages yeah. and you know finding the right audience. Um, how do we promote our reach um, to the right people who need to hear it? As well as translating from the great work that our researchers are doing, who are academics. Um, and for academics, it's very exciting. For general public, it can get dry sometimes, yeah. right? So um, there's the translation of languages, yeah. translation of the message to your audience, and the translation of research to a policymaker. Yeah. What is the most important thing in your mind and common mistakes about translating the message of the research to the policymaker? When does it get lost? Mm. Well, a common mistake from the researcher's perspective is that, uh, and this is a um, common mistake, is that sometimes they are too attached to uh, mm. a certain uh, part of their research, which might be really relevant, maybe academically might be really relevant, but not necessarily for the policy impact. Um, in writing, you we, meant, we, we spoke about uh, novel writing before. In writing, we 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 uh, we have a golden rule which is called "kill your your darlings," mm. and um, that's something that um, a fiction writer uh, is always uh, uh, is a trap that always always a fiction writer has to be very mindful uh, of. In the sense that uh, when you're writing a novel. Uh, you may be attached very much to one of your characters or uh, a part of the story that for you is so important. But actually, in the actual dynamic of the story that you're telling about, it's not the main thing. Mm -hmm. And realizing that that's your your darling, you know, like your darling. And then for, for a fiction writer, like to kill your darling is like one very important moment in the writing process. And sometimes for academics... They want to write everything, you know, right? Yeah, you see academic papers, sometimes they are extremely long and so on. And, and that's the thing. I, th- I think that academic, academic writing mu- must learn how to kill some darlings. And that's probably uh, one of the stuff that uh, needs to be done a little bit more frequently because we want to say too much in, in too little space sometimes. So we might have to, uh, to, to pick up the main, the main messages and, and, uh, and maybe write three papers instead of, of, of one, you know, like sometimes we, 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 we get scholars with, uh, with blog posts that could be, uh, three blog posts and not, not one blog post. And, and that's the role also of, uh, the communication team of professional editors as well in, in, in think tanks, professional editing is extremely important. And sometimes it's overlooked mm-hmm. by, uh, by, by, by think tanks. Or, or, well, in the academia as well, but there is a different process, of course, of peer review and so on. So it's a little bit different. But, but yeah, having professional editors that uh, knows the kind of style of writing of the audience that you want to reach, mm. it's very, very, very important. I think that's a great point about letting certain ideas go yeah. to make sure that the ones that can get through yeah. are heard. Yeah. Um, Drawing on that, in your chapter on political communication in the book for higher education, 
Mm -hmm. for a digital age. Um, You talk about best practices for having impact on policymakers. So people who read our reports, getting people to read our reports. How do we have impact on policymakers? How do we make sure that the research reaches reality? Yeah, that's that's very important because if on one hand, as we say, this first building block, we want to go deep into the analysis in order to provide uh, a contribution to this policy. And if we try to build something new with the configuration that we, with it we have in, in the think tanks, then whatever we're going to producing, if it's not going to be read by the right people, it's going to be completely lost in, uh, in space. So uh, from that point of view, that's the challenge of, of each think tank. So basically uh, reaching out uh, policymakers uh, and reaching out uh, the people that policymakers care about. These are the two key issues that, uh, in, in, in think tank communication. And this can be done, let's say, with with uh, somehow a uh, double uh, double kind of strategy. Mm-hmm. One strategy that tries to build up the network directly with the policymakers. Let's say this is like the more classic approach mm-hmm. that think tanks have been having for more than fifty years, uh, like uh, uh, trying to build the direct communication with. Um, I don't know, it would be the, the State Department or the, foreign af- or the Foreign Affairs, depending on where you, what kind of uh, configurations uh, the, the, the different governments have. Or, I mean, you, you work on public health, so probably the ministry is responsible for, for health policies and this kind of stuff. Uh, so building up a relation directly with the policymakers is obviously still very important mm-hmm. for think tanks. Mm-hmm. But like, let's say 30 years ago, this was enough. But nowadays, this is not enough anymore. Nowadays, uh, uh, policymakers are also following uh, this fast-paced uh, environment, this flow of information, yeah. and uh, this doesn't go just on one channel, but basically uh, uh, goes on multiple channels, being it the media, being it the social media, yeah. being it other other ways of engaging with uh, with uh, influencers, so-called influencers in in the policy fields, and uh, a mapping of who are the influencers uh, of the policy field you want to uh, uh, impact on is uh, extremely important and maybe the first step in order then to to reach out those uh, other channels. Yeah. That uh, and and this is uh, switching all the time. Like it's not something that uh, it's set, but it's a very dynamic. It's a very dynamic set of uh, uh, of change of audiences, of change of actors who are actually impacting on those policies. So it's much more difficult than 30 years ago to do communications for a think tank, but perhaps it's much more engaging and um, and interesting and experimental. Yeah, you bring up a good point. I think Bruegel and Capri both tried to say adaptable mm. and resilient. It's literally in Capri's mission. So you played a part in doing that um, with your role as a scout for 25 mm-hmm. years on the Scouts United Nations, global affairs, multilateral engagement, and youth advocacy team. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, I, I, I think scouting, that's very nice that you're bringing in uh, this element in my experience because uh, it's something that not all the time it's spoken about, uh, but the role of... Um, Engagement, uh, in my case, it was scouting, but can be for others, can be another, uh, another youth movement or, or political engagement into, uh, the youth wing of a political party, or it can be for, uh, you know, voluntary service, uh, in a charitable organization or whatever else. But uh, I think that actually, um, there is a role uh, in, in, in building up uh, a set of skills which are extremely important nowadays uh, by non-formal education uh, organizations. Mm-hmm. And scouting is obviously the, the largest uh, uh, non-formal education provider in, in the world. And um, I would say that some of the skills related to uh, um, Working with others, we mentioned before about working with others from different backgrounds, from from different cultures, and and so forth. It's something that uh, I de- definitely learned for the first time 
in my uh, scouting experience, uh, but also uh, other other skills which are needed for today's uh, um, let's say uh, job market. Let's put it like that. Like like leadership skills, like flexibility, like resilience mm. as well, are all kind of things that you don't really learn uh, at the university. Uh, and um, we see a lot of time young people going out of formal education, uh, which struggle with uh, with um, the the kind of environment that uh, the kind of skills which are required, but not necessarily they've been uh, they've been exposed to uh, if they didn't have other experience rather than college education and so forth. So I think that scouting uh, had, had, was playing a huge role in, in that from, from the skills perspective, from the personal perspective. And then from the more uh, political perspective, uh, as an NGO, a global NGO, who has been involved into advocacy towards the United Nations, uh, the European Union and, and public policy, uh, this also has been giving me uh, a, a good training about uh, that side of uh, of think tank uh, mission, which is about influencing policymakers. So there is not just about the part of uh, of research. There is also the part about trying to get your point through, as we were saying before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is really important to me mm. personally. Um, my alma mater is the University of Virginia's. Mm. Frank Batten School of Leadership mm. and Public Policy. They couldn't have one without the other. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like that's what you're talking about. Yeah. It makes a good team. Um, and also pushes the ideas through from paper to policy. Mm. Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit more about your science fiction writing because you, in one of your contributions in a recent book, you bring up the case in a futuristic scenario where citizenship is no longer how people identify as a subscription-based um, world, not just economy. Mm-hmm. Um, and with all the trends happening right now, I think that highlights um, a very unique environment um, in which Capri is being founded, um, in which you write. So first, I want to hear a little bit more about that idea, where it came from. Why was it important for you to write that? Um, and then second, I want to hear about what role do think tanks play in that important new global environment? Hmm. So uh, the idea of a subscription-based uh, citizenship, hmm. which is uh, mentioned in a very interesting uh, book, which uh, I contributed to. It's a, it's a, it's a handbook of international relations hmm. uh, written from the point of view of the twenty second century so it's um a unique attempt of uh, academic science fiction writing which might sound completely esoteric for most of the people uh but basically uh the idea was to write um, uh, an uh, an academic handbook exactly how you write uh, academic handbooks for master students uh, nowadays has it would have been written in a hundred years mm-hmm. with a double goal. One goal was more provocative in terms of uh, thinking uh, and using science fiction a little bit like I was saying before, mm-hmm. in order to uh, not only advance in terms of scenario making, but also using science fiction as a teaser for theoretical development and see how theoretical debates could, could evolve in the future and so on. So it's very geeky academic kind of goal. But then there was a more practical goal, which was um, uh, more like pedagogic, like how we can use science fiction with students, with students of international relations in order to uh, provoke their imagination about how international relations today are very complex and uh, how how they can be, you know, um, mm. Uh, in and out from the future scenario and and the current scenario, and that's where the idea of uh, subscription based citizenship is coming from. I mean, in Europe, we are uh, witnessing a huge debate on uh, on 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 two things. One is migration policy. Migration is really a huge uh, a huge and controversial topic uh, mm-hmm. in Europe, and the other is about. Uh, the evolution of the economy, uh, making, you know, the economy is, is um, like more and more uh, 
leaning to towards uh, models that uh, are changing from ownership to to subscription slash renting, etc. So I wanted to bring up these two things together, and I was thinking, what would happen if uh, not only you can buy a subscription for Netflix or buy a subscription for uh, car sharing, which is uh, one of the things that are getting more and more, like the private ownership of cars is probably something that would be sure. turned out in the past because, because people might continue to use cars, but it's just more efficient, environmental friendly and cheaper to just have car sharing uh, or, or stuff like this. Why wouldn't it be possible to, to imagine uh, citizenship as a subscription? Also, because we already kind of pay a subscription fee, which are called taxes, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, what we get out of, uh, of our subscription fee, well, how, how much do we get out, out of our tax pay? Uh, it's one of the big debates in, 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 in electoral uh, cycles, right? Like, uh, what do I get for the taxes that I'm paying? So, so, so I thought it would have been a nice provocation to, to think about uh, citizenship not as bound to a territory, but more like a competing uh, real where you could choose to uh, subscribe to Google that would become uh, like a full-fledged sovereign uh, networked state or to the European Union. That was the, that was the, the idea. Oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> yeah, you brought up the subscription-based economy. I was thinking about in the car example. When I was in Spain mm. for a semester, I used blah blah car. Yeah, and was like, oh, I wish this existed in the United States. Yeah, <laughs> yeah or like the bike sharing. I don't know. Many cities. I mean, I was in Beijing uh, last week, and uh, it was so easy for me to travel around because uh, they had so many bikes that I can just scan a QR code and I can just uh, uh, drive uh, drive around. Same happens uh, everywhere else in the world. So. I think this is this is something that uh, it's expanding uh, no matter where you are. Mm-hmm. And the cost associated with switching for as a consumer, for example, if I like Coke or Pepsi mm-hmm. better, is a lot lower than the cost associated with me switching my citizenship, I think. Right. Um, but it's not impossible. And people in the news talk about it a lot. It seems like, especially if they're not happy with how elections are going. Yeah. Um, and Taiwan's election is coming up this January. So we've been following other elections around the globe and um, excited to see what happens and which policymakers end up in office who we can reach to bring us to a type of conclusion. uh, I think I'd like to hear about why you believe institutions of global thought and places where international minds can meet and exchange ideas are important in that global environment you described today? Hmm. Well, I, I think that, uh, as we've been saying since the beginning, we live in a moment which is uh, characterized by a lot of polarization. Uh, polarization and, and also um, escalation of, of, um, of the way we are communicating in a conflictual manner among each other. Mm. I'm not just speaking about the big geopolitical conflicts, which uh, we are seeing, but also about how domestic uh, policy debates are, are, are made and uh, also about some very, uh, um, yeah, polarization that we're seeing also on social media and on interpersonal uh, issues. I truly believe that uh, think tanks like Bruegel or like Capri are places where within this uh, uh, sea of, uh, of polarization, you know, like the, even the media in order to sell, in order to get more advertisement uh, uh, space uh, and, and, and money uh, and audience and clicks and so on, uh, they're all uh, leveraging in this polarization so we are living in an environment and same with the electoral competition you you mentioned elections in taiwan but elections everywhere we've been seeing also the way election election campaigns i mean 
coming up their election campaign in, in the United States. I yeah. mean, that's probably the prototype of uh, polarized, polarized electoral campaign, right? So, uh, so we're seeing that uh, all this environment is leveraging on polarization. Doesn't look like in the interest of anyone to try to uh, de-escalate this polarization. If there is some uh, uh, some places where there are still some glints of trying to uh, ground uh, uh, ground uh, uh, the debate, the political debate, the policy debate on on facts, but also on bringing in different points of views in a less polarized manner, this is this is probably the role of the think tanks, and that's why. I would say think tanks comparing to 20 years ago, they have much more of a, of a societal mission uh, to preserve, uh, you know, democratic societies or to preserve a peaceful exchange of ideas or even just to preserve an exchange of ideas. Because what we are seeing is that uh, slowly, slowly, we are not even exchanging ideas anymore you know like if you are from a different point of view i don't even speak to you anymore so i think this is this is the big role that think tanks should continue to have and i do wish that uh, capri uh, since you are start just starting your adventure are going to to be a great and i'm sure of it that you're going to be a great place especially in this region and and coming back to the point about why it's needed at the regional level well, you have your answer. It's extremely needed nowadays at regional level in the Asia Pacific uh, to have to have places uh, within the region to bring together different points of views um, on a grounded way. So, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We're excited to tackle that. Yeah. Well, thank you for your final thoughts, Giuseppe. That was fantastic. I want to know what's next for you. Um, you have a new job coming up. Tell yes, uh, I'm now in Taipei, and uh, I'm doing a little a little break, sabbatical in between Bruegel and my next job. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start uh, to work for the European External Action Service, which is the EU uh, European Union uh, Foreign Affairs Service, basically the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the EU. Mm -hmm. uh, even though uh, because it's the EU, we don't have the uh, the same powers of uh, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of a, of a fully fledged uh, state and I will work in the some sort of internal think tank uh, doing strategic foresight and policy planning for them and working on geoeconomics. So I'm really excited about the new adventure. But in the meantime, I'm enjoying uh, exploring Taipei and exploring uh, this part of the world and uh, learning more about it. Yeah. Well, we're very excited for you and they're lucky to have you. Um, and if you need any recommendations around Taipei uh, for noodles. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, let us know. Um, and where can our listeners find you if they want to tune in? Well, uh, you can find me on uh, the platform uh, known as X and formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> Uh, probably you can write my, my uh, handle in the, in the show notes, mm -hmm. Rama. And of course, you can also listen to the Sound of Economics podcast, uh, which I've been hosting for the past few years and uh, still hosting for a few more weeks uh, in uh, at Bruegel. And I also have a little science fiction podcast called Europa Rama, in case you want to check it out. And uh, it's available on uh, all the usual platforms, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and so forth. Mm. Yeah. I'll be listening on my walks through Dawn Park. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, yep. Yeah. So thank you, Giuseppe. It's been an honor to have you as our first inaugural guest on this podcast. Um, and signing off from Taipei. Thank you so much. <laughs>